how much money do you need to quote unquote make it? Some of you guys may be saying $1 million while others are saying $1 billion. Something that we can all agree on though is that if you have $35 billion, you've definitely made it, right? Well, that's exactly what Ike Batista thought in late 2012. Ike was the richest man in Brazil with a net worth of $35 billion and he thought that he had made it. In fact, he teased Carlos Slim, the richest man in the world at the time, that he should watch out because Ike was coming for him. Yet, just six months later, Ike's net worth plummeted to $200 million and by early 2014, Ike found himself with a negative net worth of $1.2 billion. So here's how Ike lost everything in a matter of months. Taking a look back, Ike Batista was born on November 3rd, 1956 in Governador Valadares, Brazil. His father, Elizar Batista, was a native Brazilian businessman who served as the Minister of Mines and Energy. Meanwhile, Ike's mother was from Germany and she spent her time raising Ike and his six siblings. Ike spent most of his childhood in Brazil, but his family would move to Europe when Ike was a teenager due to his father's work. During their time in Europe, the family lived in Geneva, Dusseldorf, and Brussels. His family actually moved back to Brazil when Ike turned 18, but Ike decided that he wanted to stay behind and enroll in a European university. In 1974, Ike enrolled in the University of Aachen in Germany and began pursuing a metallurgical engineering degree. It doesn't look like Ike's parents paid for his education though, at least not fully, as Ike had to sell insurance policies door to door to sustain himself in Germany. Ike later revealed that the stress of trying to make a living selling insurance was one of the most valuable parts of his academic career. Anyway, Ike returned to Brazil in the early 1980s and set his sights on the mining and trading industries. At age 23, Ike founded a gold trading company called Autram Aram. Ike wasn't doing anything revolutionary. He was simply buying gold from producers in the Amazon and selling it to buyers in European and Brazilian cities. Despite the simplicity of the endeavor, it was extremely successful. The company earned $6 million within just the first 18 months of operations. Though the company was growing rapidly, Ike didn't just want to be a middleman forever. So he founded a gold mining company called the EBX Group. And to give himself an advantage against competitors, Ike brought modern technology to gold mining. With the EBX Group, Ike created the first mechanized alluvial gold mining plant in the Amazon. A couple of years later, Ike expanded his mining operations internationally with the founding of TVX Gold which was based in Canada. Ike would take the company public on the Montreal Stock Exchange shortly after, but this was a move that he later regretted. In the meantime though, things were going great. By the end of the century, the EBX Group was operating 8 gold mines in Brazil and Canada and a silver mine in Chile. And these mines had produced a total of $20 billion worth of value since their creation. This made Ike quite wealthy, but he still had a ways to go before reaching billionaire status. In the 2000s, Ike opened company after company and diversified into as many industries as he could. For example, in 2001, Ike founded MPX, which was a power generation company based in Rio de Janeiro. A few years later, in 2005, Ike created MMX, which focused on mining and trading iron ore in Brazil and Chile. Similarly, in 2007, Ike founded LLX, which focused on providing logistics to Ike's other companies. But by far his most ambitious and daring endeavor was OGX. With OGX, Ike aimed to create a global oil producing giant based in Brazil. In 2007, Ike started searching Brazil and he eventually landed on an oil reserve with $1 trillion worth of deposits. To put that into perspective, Saudi Arabia's natural resources add up to $34.4 trillion. So Ike wasn't going to dethrone the real oil giants anytime soon, but $1 trillion worth of deposits was still a massive discovery. Ike took the company public in June of 2008, raising a record $4.3 billion. And this is what pushed him over the edge to billionaire status. Around the same time, Ike founded one more company called OSX in 2007, which focused on building ships. With all of these companies up and running, Ike turned his focus onto growing these companies. You might have noticed that all of his companies end with the letter X, which was on purpose. Ike believed that the X symbolized multiplication and exponential growth. And that naming scheme was pretty accurate as his companies exploded in the late 2000s and early 2010s. Much of Brazil and the media loved Ike because of his extreme Brazilian pride. Ike strongly believed that Brazil was on the brink of an economic boom and that it was his duty to lead Brazil to the next level. Ike wasn't some saint or anything, but he did everything he could to earn Brazil positive press. 
In 2009, for instance, Ike played a key role in helping Rio de Janeiro win the bid for the 2016 Olympic Games. Aside from his strong Brazilian pride, Ike had massive pride in himself as well. Ike believed that he was going to become the world's richest man by 2020 with a net worth of $100 billion. And given that he was worth $35 billion and the 7th richest person in the world, this was honestly a pretty realistic goal for him. Unfortunately though, fate had a different idea. Despite Ike's rather positive public persona, there was a group of people that despised him for his business practices. His company, MMX, breached a slew of environmental regulations and had been fined several times. MMX was also accused of bribing and coercing a native Indian group off their land in 2008. That same year, Brazilian police raided Ike's homes and offices in an effort to find evidence of gold smuggling and tax evasion. But they were unable to find any evidence. So, while Ike had some red flags here and there, they weren't too concerning. Unfortunately, there wasn't much time left when the major red flags came up. In late 2012, gold had a flash crash. Gold plummeted from $1,800 an ounce to $1,200 an ounce within just a few months. This was the first time that gold had crashed during Ike's career. Gold had a similar run-up and a crash in the late 1970s during the inflation crisis. But since Ike started mining and trading in the early 1980s, gold had more or less just gone sideways or up. In the meantime, silver got crushed even harder. Between 2011 and 2013, silver prices plummeted from $1,500 per kilogram to $650 per kilogram, and silver still hasn't recovered. No one really knows what specifically triggered this crash in precious metals. It's agreed upon that once the selling started, computer algorithms started dumping positions and this worsened the sell-off. But we don't really know what triggered the initial sell-off. There is speculation that big banks triggered the sell-off in order to accumulate at cheaper levels, but that's not confirmed. Whatever the reason though, Ike's companies instantly felt the pain of this flash crash. His mining and trading companies started losing hundreds of millions of dollars. If this was the only issue, I think Ike could have handled it. However, Ike was about to face another massive blow with his oil company, OGX. Ike had promised that his oil company would pump 750,000 barrels per day, but there was a massive problem. Since founding the company, Brazil had chosen to nationalize oil production, which meant that Ike no longer had access to the $1 trillion oil deposit he discovered. Ike was optimistic that he could still make OGX work by drilling for oil in parts of Brazil where it was still allowed. But at the end of the day, OGX was only able to pump 15,000 barrels per day, which is a far cry from the promised 750,000. After seeing these disappointing numbers, investors fled OGX stock, and Ike struggled to fund the money losing company. Ike says that if he had kept his companies private and relied on private investors, they likely wouldn't have dumped their positions as aggressively. And while that is likely true, private investors likely wouldn't have bid up his company so much in the first place. So Ike might have had less cash to run his companies if he chose the private route. Ike started selling off his assets to try to keep the company running. For example, Ike sold most of LLX to a US investment group for $559 million. But given that everyone was dumping all of his companies, it was extremely difficult to raise enough money to keep OGX afloat. All of these pressures peaked in October of 2013 when OGX defaulted on a $45 million interest payment. And at the end of October, Ike had no choice but to give in and let OGX file for bankruptcy. Just 12 days later, OSX would also file for bankruptcy. At this point, Ike's massive conglomerate of companies had shrunk into just MMX and MPX. And Ike's liabilities far outweighed his assets which gave him a net worth of negative $1.2 billion. MMX and MPX stayed alive for the time being, but these would also crumble over the next few years. In December of 2014, MPX filed for bankruptcy, and MMX followed behind in November of 2016. Ike's financial success was gone, but soon his personal freedom would be taken away as well. With his money and influence gone, Brazilian regulators decided to crack down on Ike. In January of 2017, Ike was arrested and thrown in prison by Brazilian authorities for money laundering and bribery. Can you believe that just 5 years ago, Ike was the 7th richest person in the world, but now he was in jail. Ike was sentenced to 30 years in prison for laundering $100 million and bribing the former governor of Rio de Janeiro with $16.6 .6 million to give his companies government contracts. On top of this, he was also convicted for insider trading. Ike didn't actually spend 30 years in prison though. Ike's lawyers would appeal the verdict and work out a plea bargain. In March of 2020, Ike agreed to pay $160 million and give up everyone associated with the money laundering and insider trading schemes. 
At this point, most people would just stay out of the public's view and live the rest of their lives under the radar. But this is not the case with Ike Batista. In October of 2020, Ike announced that he was going to restart MMX and get back into the mining business. Ike says that he's going to pay back all of his debt and that he's going to rise to the top once again. Ike's unbeatable spirit is definitely something to admire. But we'll have to see how well his second try at entrepreneurship goes. At the end of the day, Ike had a massive empire on his hands, but it looks like he bit off more than he could chew. And as soon as the market and policies turned against him, his empire crumbled. Hopefully, he doesn't make the same mistake once again. Do you guys think Ike can make a comeback and return to $35 billion? Comment that down below. Also, drop a like if you admire Ike's resilience. And of course, consider joining our Discord community to suggest future video ideas and consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.